This is Business Inspires, a monthly podcast of the Tri-Village Chamber Partnership. To run a successful business, you need resources, valuable connections, and community recognition. Business Inspires will provide you with the tools, resources, and examples to inspire you to create the business you're envisioning. Here's Michelle Wilson, Executive Director of the Tri-Village Chamber Partnership. Today we'll be speaking with Scott with the Right Pat Credit Union. And welcome, Scott. Thank you. So glad to have you here. Uh, this is only our second podcast, so we're really happy to have you as part of this beginning series cool. with us. And um, I'd like to just uh, first just tell me a little bit about yourself, what you do with the credit union. Sure. Okay. Well, thanks for having me, first of all. Um, we're really excited to be part of the Columbus uh, community again. We had a foray here re- uh, previously in the past, but we're, we're, we're here again to stay. So um, in any event, my name is Scott Everett. I'm the general counsel at the Credit Union, and I'm also the vice president of business services. So I do something different every single day, uh, which is why I love my job. Um, I was hired in as the, as the counsel. And we have 760 employees, so there's any number of issues that come up, both with our employee base, but also with our 300,000 plus members. Um, I'm responsible for all of our regulatory advocacy. So both at the state and federal level, I do a lot of work with our elected officials and uh, the agency uh, apparatus to help with rulemaking and things like that. And then in the commercial services space, uh, we had a fairly small group that I've been involved in um, helping for about the last year and a half. Great. Uh, So I've been with the credit union about two and a half years. Wonderful. And of the 760 employees, is that Columbus-based or is that uh, all over White right Path? That's across the state. Okay. Um, most of most of the folks are actually at our corporate office, which is in Beaver Creek, right near okay. the Air Force Base. Great. Um, so we have about five locations here now. And you touched a little bit on um, your foray back into the Columbus market. I know you were here, mm-hmm. and then you, you came back in again. Tell me a little bit about that process and sure. timeline. Sure. I, I think it was uh, a, a tepid introduction into the market, as I'll say. And I wasn't here when I was when, when that was going on, but our CEO, Doug Fecker, was. And so they sort of had just an outpost that wasn't really uh, resourced very effectively uh, or marketed, which is you probably well know is the critical thing to kind of break through the noise and get your foothold established. And so they retrenched uh, about 10 years ago and closed down. I think it was just a single branch in the metro area. And then here within the last five years, they did a polling of the membership because our members own us and said, where do you want us to go next? Um, We have a pretty significant market share in Columbus, so or excuse me, Dayton. So to grow, we had to go some direction. And the membership voted overwhelmingly for us to come back to Columbus. Good. Uh, So we did a lot of market studies, a lot of more surveys and things like that to support the initiative and ultimately worked with a number of consultants and ended up building five branches uh, throughout Metro Columbus and then here towards the, the Northwest. And so how how did you market differently and how has that, that gone this time? Um, I think just being more uh, conscientious of the fact that it is, it is a significant investment. You do need to have a market leader. Um, mm-hmm. So we have a woman by the name of Tammy Jones who's a career credit union person and a career Columbus uh, native. And so just getting that local hire who had a presence here was step one. The other thing was um, the, the groups that we work with sort of emphasize that Columbus is a big and growing city, and so you can't be everywhere all at once. So you have, sort of have to pick a footprint And we call it a hub-and-spoke model. Mm -hmm. So we sort of had one large traditional uh, branch location, and then we built uh, four around it. So it gets you sort of a network effect. So when people are driving around, they tend to see right back credit union, and then they see it again, and then they see it again. And so it sort of resonates a little bit more effectively with them. So that was the big thing. Um, We've tweaked our approach here within the last uh, 12 to 18 months um, while consumer – Uh, Financial services will always be our emphasis. What we found here is this is a younger demographic. They're more technologically savvy. Mm -hmm. Um, So what we're sort of focused on now is leading with two things, which is mortgage lending, trying to help folks primarily get into a really affordable mortgage, um, primarily uh, first-time home buyers, and then business lending. Um, for a number of reasons. But those seem to be the the two items that once we get that initial relationship, it tends to cluster where folks will bring more and more of their business to us. Sure. And speaking of business lending, of course, what I would love to know, um, well, let's let's backtrack for just a moment and just tell me what what Right Pat does to differentiate itself in the market. There's a lot of financial institutions. And so what makes you different? Yeah. Um, 
Well, I think the reason I can speak from personal experience. I mean, this is this, our CEO wants us to be the best place you've ever worked and the best pl- place people have ever experienced for financial services. And, and I can truly say it is from an employee perspective. And that bleeds over to how we serve members. So the first thing is people should understand it's a credit union. So it's a financial cooperative. Mm-hmm. Right, Pat is the largest financial cooperative in the state of Ohio with $3.4 billion in assets. And so we started in 1932 at Wright Airfield. Um, a gentleman got very sick back in the day before you couldn't get health insurance. You didn't have unemployment. You didn't have days off. And so when he had to leave work to take care of a family member and himself, uh, the other folks in this machine shop basically said, he's going to become destitute if we don't help him. And so they got a shoebox every week and they would get their pay. They would drop a quarter in the shoebox and they allowed him to borrow from that to help take care of his family. And when he came back, he paid the money back. They said, this is a pretty good idea. Let's do it again. Oh my gosh, that's the, great. That shoebox is called the, was called the Sunshine Fund. And today, if you come to our corporate office, there's the Sunshine Fund Cafe. So the same principle guides what we do every single day. And it's really people helping people, meeting folks where they're at in their financial situation, really emphasizing education over transactional relationships and sales. Um, And and at the end of the day, the members own us, and so they drive all of our decision-making. So when someone comes in with a problem, whether they have a $500 stretch pay loan to get them from payday to payday, or they have all their financial services with us, I think they'll find that they get a real personal touch and, and experience. And at a higher level, from an executive standpoint, what's really great is we all have to make a return on our assets. Anything we make above and beyond what we need to operate our business and have adequate capital levels, we give back to the membership. And so it truly is a financial cooperative in that the more you use of the credit union, the more you personally benefit, not only in terms of rates on both loans and deposit products, but you actually get a dividend check at the end of each year. Every year. Every year it's been since I've been involved with them, which is we're going on, I believe, eight years straight now. Um, and last year was $8 million, which was a record for us. Oh, my gosh. So we're able to do a lot for folks. Yeah. And I think, you know, whether you want to talk about business services or consumers, the biggest thing, especially as an attorney, is a lot of times when situations come to me, it's not of the best of times. Um, but I always tell folks, look, we want you to survive and and work through this. We don't want you to leave the credit union. We don't want you to lose your sort of foothold. And so we're really focused on dealing with the individual and working through the situation with them as opposed to taking a macro approach and kind of making the sausage, if you will. (laughs) Um, So I I think that's been the reason both that we're different, but also the reason we've been so successful. Good. Well, I'm intrigued by um, your CEO wanting it to be the best place to work. So how... What are some initiatives that take place internally that would be interesting for everybody to hear? Um, I, I'd say a few things. The, the one thing is is that we don't necessarily pay at the top of the market, but I think you'll find probably the richest benefit package that you can get. Um, and we hire a lot of um, people. It's their first job. It's their first experience. And we really emphasize promoting from within. So we give people really strong health care benefits. We give them really strong incentives and retirement programs so that they can focus on servicing the member. Okay. Um, we also provide educational benefits. So we sort of do pretty in-depth career planning from the moment you walk in the door until you get to potentially my level and say, well, where do you want to be? You know, where are you at educationally and how can we improve your situation? Um, and so a lot of the folks, that if you wander around the credit union, whether it's a branch or a corporate office, there, there's people that have been there for decades uh, because of that ethos. And the, I think the other thing is it just comes down to philosophy. I've worked a lot of places where it's you can have a bad month but don't have a bad quarter type of mentality. <laughs> and th- this place, it's really we – we work to live. We don't live to work. And so people feel like when they come in, they can give their all because when they go home at the end of the day, it's about being with your families and, and focusing on your personal life. So there's a really good balance in our well, and culture is such a hot topic right now that, you know, it's, it's difficult sometimes for companies to pay top salaries and provide top benefit packages. And just the culture itself has to lend itself to your lifestyle, and and that's good to hear that that's something that they're really sure. focused on. I, sure. I love that. I find, especially with this generation coming up behind me, that they're much uh, more clear-eyed, I think, than I was probably at 22, 25, is that it's not all about money to them. Mm-hmm. It's not all about success. They want a company that's a good corporate steward, that treats people fairly, that they feel like they have an investment 
stake in the business and the success of it, and then they'll stick with you. And so uh, I think if we've learned anything from the last five or six years in the financial world, that's what we've learned. And so you have to kind of build a culture around the expectations of the younger generation that's coming up. Sure. And part of that, as you said, is is giving back to the community and being involved in the community. And I know Wright Pat has um, a great foothold in Columbus community initiatives already, mm-hmm. you know, in a few short years. And I'm sure you – I'm certain you do in the Dayton-Montgomery County area. But um, – you mentioned the uh, Sunshine Community Fund or community initiative. So I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that and you know how people can access that, w- what it's all about. Just give me the background on it. Sure. Um, well, we do a couple of things. at the. Uh, we have a big employee day where um, we get everyone together. And, and again, top to bottom, we, we share feedback. We share the direction of the credit union, how we perform financially, things like that. But the biggest part of the day is we announce each year uh, two charities that we're going to highlight and support. Okay. And so – it spans, you know, the full spectrum from we run all sorts of contests internally, baking contests. You can wear jeans to work. You can go out and do car washes. Anything that the staff can come up with to raise money for a cause, we will support, both in terms of you can take the time off to do this. Um, we will go volunteer at their events, things like that. And we really focus on setting a goal and trying to raise as much funds for those entities as possible. So, you know, typically it ranges from one hundred and fifty to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, which for you know folks that are providing school supplies to disadvantaged kids, for example, it's it's a really big difference mm-hmm, in sure. their operating efforts. And so, um, but but what I would emphasize more so than the financial contribution is just the it's an excessive number of our staff that actively participate in the programs right. and how we select these charities is is through their suggestions. Oh, good. So okay. people at the community are absolutely. Um, more than encouraged to come to us and say, hey, I have a worthy cause. You should take a look at me. This is what I'm doing to benefit the community. Uh, But more often than not, it comes from a partner, as we call our employees, saying, I work with this group on the side, or I got connected with them with my church, or they helped me in a situation. Um, And that's how we tend to select them. So it ranges from people that are really focused on cancer research that we we did a year or two ago to, as I alluded to before, you know, school supplies for kids, and then mm-hmm. Ronald McDonald House has been sort of a recurrent uh, player. Um, one of the big events that we do every year is a golf outing, oh, okay. and a hundred percent of the proceeds that we raise for that go directly to the charity. A hundred percent. That's great. Yeah. Wow, so, you guys are doing some wonderful things. I love hearing. All yeah, that. so it's good, and and we really want to do more in Columbus. I think it's an interesting transition for us. We've been s- so hyper focused on Dayton, and again, there's business reasons, but there's also the demographic ch- shifts. And and, and the fact sure. that Columbus is the, the largest market um, in Ohio, and it's really an area where we want to grow and, and people want us to be. And so we're looking for more community partners to approach us, I would say, okay. um, and, and tell us their story and say, this is, this is why you should partner with me, and this is how you can not only help benefit yourselves, but benefit the, the community. Fantastic. Wonderful. Michelle will be right back with her guest on Business Inspires right after this. This is Kelly. And this is Leslie, and we're the Dollar Saving Divas. We've recorded a few podcasts about dining and shopping in Grandview, and we're excited to tell you about Dig the Tour Weekend in Grandview, June 16th and 17th. Three big events in one weekend. Friday, June 16th, the Tour de Grandview Cycling Classic attracts an international field of several hundred professional cyclists to Central Ohio, as well as cycling enthusiasts and spectators from throughout the Midwest. The Tour features world-class bicycle racing through the streets of Grandview, as well as events and activities for spectators and cyclists alike. The Tri-Village Chamber Partnership proudly presents DigFest on Saturday, June 17th, featuring the best in local craft beers, liquors, and wines with music and entertainment all at the Grandview Yard. And don't forget the St. Christopher Parish Festival, featuring live bands and fun for the entire family. For more information on Dig the Tour weekend events and to book your accommodations, head to destinationgrandview.org. And now back to Michelle and her guest on Business Inspires. Well, I'd love to uh, switch gears a little bit now and talk about your small business um, efforts. I think you guys are refocusing to to have more of a foothold on, on the small business lending mm-hmm. and, and some of the benefits of that. Sure. 
Um, we we call it member business services. Okay. And uh, it's been sort of a, a interesting evolution. A lot of credit unions have traditionally outsourced a lot of those services because they're expensive to stand up. You, you can give anyone a loan, but on the deposit side, you have to have the technology and the infrastructure to do it. And so – what we're trying to build is sort of a relationship approach where we, we people not only come to us for their next lending need, but they actually engage us as a full relationship. And so, so the things that we're doing there, and we've seen a lot of success, is um, I think with the, the financial crisis and some of the swings in the markets that a lot of the larger commercial banks, they've gotten much more fickle with the types of credits that they want to do and the types of people that they want to do business with. And it really comes down to, frankly, it's just as expensive to make someone a $200,000 business loan as it is to make a tour of $2 million or a $20 million business loan in a lot of instances. You still have to underwrite it. You still have to know that consumer. It's a lot to get to the table. And so there's a less and less, and less incentive the, the smaller the business is and the smaller their financial needs are for a lot of the financial services marketplace to serve those people. And so we see that as not a negative. It's an opportunity for us. Um, when you have 300 and some thousand members, inevitably a big percentage of them have small businesses on the side. They've always wanted to leave their job and start a small business, and so they don't even really know where to start. And we try to provide a really open environment to say, it's okay if you just have an idea. We have someone here who will sit down with you and help you understand more of the pragmatic sides, which is the finance. How are you going to finance your operations and do it in a balanced and measured way? So we try to take a consultative approach uh, with folks. Um, But really what I've tried to focus my team on is – let's find that segment of the market that really just does need their first loan or their their lending needs are you know below a half a million dollars and a few things that we've done to make things easier is underwriting is always painful anybody who's gotten a mortgage knows it's not real fun to go gather up all your financial information and so we've put in a system similar to some of the things folks will see on the internet with marketplace lenders where if you have a business loan request that's between zero and two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, we have an automated scoring tool that we use. So most requests we can take a simple application from you and run a combination of your business and personal credit and give you an answer within the day. Wow. And fund you within three or four days. And I think most people would be surprised to learn that about a credit union. Um what I'm what I've been studying is is this again, this rise of these marketplace lenders, and people think, okay, well, it's an easy way to get funding. I don't have to deal with a banker. And I would encourage folks to look at the rate that you're going to pay, both in origination costs and interest rate, and then come compare it to a place like Right Pat, because I can assure you from what I've seen, you'll do infinitely better. And you'll also have someone who can help you. Um, sort of structure your business in the correct way. Um, and would that include help with a business plan? If, if they walk into you and say, this is what I think I want to do, and how, you know, how do I get started? Is there, are there resources to help them besides the finance portion of it just kind of get their ducks in a row? Yeah. There, we have a group of experienced commercial lenders. Okay. And so folks that have been in the banking industry for two, three decades, and they also have credit experience. So I'm not going to tell you that we're business plan experts because sure. we're not. But most of these folks are networked, and we are as well, with business incubators, with the Small Business Administration, with other folks that really know this as their business. So we can at least give you an initial screen, help understand what you're trying to accomplish and why, and maybe give you some general advice about financial structuring. But we would probably tend to, to direct you to a partner of ours. Right. Um, but we don't want people to be intimidated from asking those questions because right. I think that's the biggest thing is we see a lot of times people don't do the planning and they start borrowing and they start building. And a lot of it is they're leveraging their personal assets. Mm-hmm. And so especially as an attorney, yes, we can give you the basic advice to say, well, you need to have a corporate structure in place to protect yourself. Um, this is how you do it. It's fairly simple. Um, and this is how you make yourself attractive from a financing perspective uh, for lenders like us. And so I'd say we could probably uh, certainly accommodate high-level advice. And then we do have the network of folks that we can direct people to. Great. I love anytime you rely on partners and partnerships. I think it makes any business stronger. Sure. So that's that's great to hear. And um, 
a few years ago, there was a, a hot buzzword micro lending. Is that, is that still a thing? And, you know, is that, does a business have to be a certain size or have a certain portfolio for them to mm-hmm. come to you and, um, well, it depends on how you define it. Okay. So, you know, so clear I've, it up for me. <laughs> well, I've read it in a couple of different contexts. I, you know, I, what I've what I've read it is, you know, again, I think it alludes to what I referenced before, which is if you have a business, let's say you're starting a landscaping company, okay. and you need to buy two trucks, and it's sixty thousand dollars. I mean, a lot of places you're not going to get a phone call back, or you're going to get put into usury rates. So, micro lending to me is a lot of people have started up informal cooperatives based on their culture, based on the business that they may be in, based on the neighborhood they may be living in, and they sort of cooperatively lend a business each month. I know here in Columbus there's a very big Somalian community, for example, Mm -hmm. and I think they do a lot of that. Um, The other way that I suppose you could define it is just based on the dollar size of the loan. That's probably easier for me to speak to. Um, because the concern I have about folks that are doing micro lending that's been covered in the press is, are you building a credit history for yourself? I mean, it's hard to get from off book lending and come into a lender like me and say, well, this has been my financial performance and this is what I've borrowed. Okay. Well, without the documentation to show that, you may be running in place to a degree. So I'd always encourage folks to come talk to us first. Okay. Um, because then we can start to build a credit history, even if we can't maybe give you the loan to start the business the way you absolutely envision it from day one, we can at least get you ramped up, provide you the resources that you need to build it in the right way, and then you have a partner that starts to know you. I mean, a lot of our lending decisions are based not just on the financial metrics that everyone looks at is who are who is this person? How long have they done business with us? What what do they do in the community? Um, how stable is their deposit activity? How stable is their their personal activities? Um, it's a lot more predictive in my experience to lend to folks where you can see a track record of more of the soft skills than just saying, okay, this is the credit score and this is their how their debt service coverage pencils out. Right. Um, and I think so. that relationship piece has got to make everybody feel a little bit more at ease about coming in and establishing a relationship and yeah. and uh, and going from there and even getting guidance if they don't have that portfolio just yet. Yeah. So that's really exciting. What's been really surprising to me is I'll define them as small businesses, and we can talk about that if you want, but relatively small businesses, 10, 20, 30, 50 employees, very successful, very smart people, but they've had – a bad experience with a with a commercial bank with a traditional approach where for whatever reason the decisions aren't made locally and so in any given year and every given quarter it's not about you as your and your business but we've just decided we don't want to lend this type of operation anymore well that can be financially devastating for somebody for example who runs a seasonal business and relies on a line of credit to be there when they need it um, what I can look anyone in the eye and promise them is that if you come and do business with us and we agree to start with you, we will never revoke our commitment to lend you simply because the whims of the market, because I'm not beholden to shareholders. I'm not beholden to the for-profit world. Um, so it's really about helping businesses grow, helping promote more job growth in places like Columbus and Dayton and getting on more solid financial footing so that we keep more young people here, and we continue to perpetuate growth of the most important segment of our economy, which is which is small business owners. Well, that's exciting to hear, and you you almost answered my uh, my last question, which was make it crystal clear to me, maybe an elevator pitch style. You know, why a credit union over a fi- traditional financial institution? What are the differences that people should just know? Mm. I think the 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 couple that I would take off is you have a vested interest in, in this operation because you own a piece of it. I think the other thing is is that we don't sit down and do things purely out of a profit motive. We offer all sorts of products that we don't make any money on. And and the number one example of that is when we sit with our board, who's a completely volunteer board, uh, non-paid, they're members that have been with us for years and years and years, and we ask them to do anything, either discontinue something, raise the pricing on something, enhance something, they say, what's in it for the member? And so we're guided 100% of the time by what's in the best interest of that individual that's coming in every day and dealing with us. And then the fourth thing, which I alluded to, which is the decisions are made locally. And if you're not happy with something, you can find my phone number, you can find me, you can find the CEO, and we will return your call. 
And so you'll find that a lot of things run smoother when people are personally accountable to you. Um, and I truly do believe that, you know, as, a, as an attorney, it's always the clients in charge. And, right. you know, now as a quasi banker, I guess, you know, the member is always in charge. And there's just a different feel to that. Um, and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the number of times that I've seen things, especially when I supported Ray Pat as outside counsel. And I'd say, well, here's the legal standing. You don't have to do this or you're not responsible. Rarely, if ever, would they do anything that wasn't in the member's best interest. I mean, they go above and beyond, especially for people, which we all do, who hit financial straits or run into difficult times to know that you're not going to have an arbitrary knee-jerk response to that. You're going to have somebody that you actually get the opportunity to sit down and explain your situation to. And I think in this day and age, that is a major difference. Um, and, and I would say it's not – I don't go about disparaging – commercial banks at large. I think community banks serve an equally uh, important role uh, when run the right way. And I think it's more the size of the institution that matters and how community oriented they are than the actual sort of corporate structure. Sure. Um, but, but that nonprofit status does allow us to do a lot more that's member centric. It allows us to do a lot more that's long term focused than I think a traditional for profit operation does. That's so, that's great. And does that answer your question? It does answer okay. my question. Yes, and I, I didn't at all mean to disparage uh, traditional, you know, banks and financial institutions either. We have a lot of um, smaller independent banks in this area, and that's this area is made up so much of small business. And you yeah. know, so we want that's why we wanted to speak with you today as a credit union and and how you reach out to the small businesses and support them. So this has all been and great to hear. And since you said people can look you up and find you, why don't you tell us how uh, people can find Right Pat? to the, maybe the branch locations here in this area and sure. uh, and then the the website. Sure. Um, it's WPCU.coop, so co-op, C-O-O-P. Oh, good. Um, and we have 31 branches. As I mentioned, there's five here in Columbus. Um, I'm not probably going to name all of them for you, but I know we have one on Lane Avenue. We have Short North. We have Graceland. We have Grandview Yard. And there's always the fifth that escapes me. Um, but they're all clustered sort of around downtown and then northwest emanating out of the Ohio State campus. Right. And so we're actually in the planning process right now to kind of look at where do we go next. Oh, good. Um, the other thing I, I, I would, would say to folks out there is that when we came, the way credit unions work is you have to have – a membership. You have to qualify people. So when we first came into Columbus, you had to live, work, or worship in Franklin County. And we've just been recently authorized uh, to add all the Collar counties around Metro Columbus. Oh, okay. So it gives us a much larger footprint. It allows us to serve a lot more people. Um, and so there is information on our website, but I always tell folks it's, you know, people think, well, I can't join a credit union, especially when it's called Right Pat. They think they have to be affiliated with the Air Force Base. We have what's called a community charter. Okay. So as long as you live, work, worship in um, Franklin County or any of the Collar counties, then, then we're happy to serve you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us here on Business Inspires. We're so glad you made it back into Columbus and, and it's going strong and it looks like, sounds like it might grow even more. So we're glad to hear that. But thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. Thanks for subscribing, downloading, and listening to Business Inspires, a monthly podcast of the Tri-Village Chamber Partnership. Our innovative and active chamber is successful because of our smart and engaged members who cultivate our strong business community. With more than 60 years as an integral part of the Grandview, Upper Arlington, and Marble Cliff communities, the Tri-Village Chamber Partnership is dedicated to a single purpose, the success of the business community. You can find a link to our website in the podcast notes to learn more about the Tri-Village Chamber Partnership. For information about this podcast, to schedule a guest appearance, or to find out more about sponsoring this podcast, our contact information is in the podcast notes. Make sure you rate and review our podcast on iTunes. That helps us spread the word about Business Inspires. Circle270media.com